La dottoressa Wendy Levinson, medico, professore di medicina presso l'Università di Toronto, è un'esperta nazionale ed internazionale nel campo della comunicazione medico-paziente. In particolare, essa ha trattato il tema della divulgazione degli errori medici ai pazienti e alla professoressa Levinson è stato recentemente affidato l'importante incarico di Officer dell'Order of Canada per questa attività. È pure responsabile di Choosing Wisely Canada e coordina tutti i lavori di Choosing Wisely in ben 17 paesi di tutto il mondo. Quindi per noi è un grandissimo onore poterla accogliere a Lugano e in questo senso le cedo ben volentieri il microfono per presentarci, eh, per farci un'introduzione su Choosing Wisely, cosa è, quali sono gli elementi che hanno portato al lancio di questo movimento e quindi benvenuta e grazie ancora. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here and actually I'm just amazed by the number of people who registered for the conference. Um, I think it's a really great sign of the level of energy and interest in Switzerland and I'm, I'm pretty envious. I don't think we would have this number of people in North America. So uh, it's a good beginning. So um, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, what's evolving across North America and really around the world because I, I do think Choosing Wisely is resonating broadly and I think it's important to think about why that is and how we can use that to really enhance the efforts that we are seeking. So everybody knows around the world that the cost of health care is very high and rising. In the United States it's over 18 percent of the gross domestic product. I think in Switzerland it's uh, over 14 percent of gross domestic product but whatever it is it's a lot. And obviously the political people, government people, um, are very concerned about these numbers because of the influence on our economies around the world. Um, and, but it's not just how much money we spend, it's how we use those funds and whether they deliver value for the patients that we see. And this is a famous slide, I think, from Don Berwick who is the head of, and creator of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And what Dr. Berwick says is that whatever the cost of healthcare in terms of gross domestic product and its rise, there are what he calls the wedges of waste. And the wedges of waste uh, pertain to a number of drivers. One is failures of the care delivery system, that's the kinds of complications that happen when we don't prevent uh, early um, care in diabetics. Um, there's a failure of care coordination. I'm sure in your country, as in ours, um, there are many patients that come to the emergency room that, where they don't know what the family doctor found or they don't know what the specialist found, and so we repeat the tests. Those are the failures of coordination in our care. And there's a very big wedge of waste that Dr. Berwick calls overtreatment, and I would call it overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And in aggregate, research from the Institute of Medicine in the US finds that 30% of all of the care delivered in the United States does not add value for patients. So it doesn't help patients, and in fact, it might even be harmful. And I always thought in Canada, where we have a single payer, that that 30% number would be too high. But I can tell you in the research in Canada and in a number of countries, this 30% of care that doesn't add value keeps emerging because probably it's about where we are that we overdiagnose and overtreat and not add value with almost a third of our money. So I think we have to really look at not just how much we spend, but how we spend it. Now, I always say, as a physician, I don't get up in the morning and go to work to treat the gross domestic product. I'm trying to treat the patient. So patients say to me all the time, well, why do doctors order tests that aren't needed? It's not intuitive to patients. 
And like the previous speaker, I think there are many reasons, and I'll just go through them quickly because I think you captured them, but I think they're the bubbles in, patient, in doctors' heads. Patients want it. We definitely have a culture, and I think it's a worldwide culture in developed countries, where patients think that they need tests and treatments. If they go home to their partner, their spouse, and the spouse says, what did the doctor do? What? You didn't get a prescription? You didn't get a test? We, that it's equated to not having gotten care because we've taught patients over time that tests and treatments equate to care. We, built, we helped to build that culture. And especially in primary care, our research shows that primary care doctors very much are concerned about patients' expectations coming in asking for images, imaging for low back pain or antibiotics. Secondly, um, we are enamored with new tests and treatments. Uh, I think both physicians and patients have a belief that new and is sophisticated is better. And so we dr we're drawn to that. In North America and the States, there's a lot of advertising to consumers about tests so that if you come to have this new test, your, di your cancer will be diagnosed quickly and you'll be saved. And so patients seek new tests and doctors also seek new tests. I say it's better to do something than nothing, and I think that's what the previous speaker said too. It's hard to explain to patients why they don't need something. That's, I really like the analogy of the soccer um, uh, goalie because um, we have to work on this. Um, we run a workshop in Ontario called Don't Just Do Something, Stand There um, the, because we're trying to change that culture. Um, I think there's a big amount of this that comes from referring between us as primary care doctors and specialists. So primary care doctors will tell me that specialists sent back a referral note that required a lot of tests and they feel like the specialist wanted it, therefore they have to do it. And specialists often say that the primary care doctor sent them to get that stress echo or whatever it is and so they feel obligated. So we a little bit do this and create this over-ordering between us. Um, we already talked about and heard about not wanting to get sued. I think that's a factor, but I don't think it's the dominant factor. Misaligned financial incentives we also heard about where physicians are paid more to do more. But I'm going to tell you that of all of this, I think the most important driver of overuse is this last bubble. I've always done it this way. We teach students in medical education that they should practice this way. When I see a patient with X, I always do all these tests. And I'm gonna talk more about medical education in a moment, but I can tell you there's evolving research that shows that once you learn this is how you practice, it sticks with you throughout your practice career and it's very resistant to change. So we embed this early in medical education. So there are a plethora of factors that lead to over-ordering. So um, the campaign um, in North America has this statement. It's a campaign to engage, for physicians and patients to engage in conversations about unnecessary tests and treatments and help physicians and patients make smart and effective choices for high quality of care. So it is about creating that conversation. Nowhere on that slide do you see the word cost because we don't go to work to care for patients thinking primarily about cost. We think about caring for the patient in front of us. And I think it's why the campaign is, had a lot of resonance because it is what we do daily, which is in every interaction making decisions with patients. And so it's framed as a conversation. So most of the campaigns um, around the world are emerging to have these components. Um, there is largely a physician component, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about that because this is a physician, and I, I'd say nurses and pharmacists, other health professionals, but it is led by physicians um, and other pr professionals to create the lists or uh, outline the recommendations about what's necessary and what's not. 
It has a patient component, and I'll share a little bit from North America about that. Uh, I think working with the media is very important, and I know that you've had some media attention. In North America, the media has been quite interested in this campaign because typically they hear doctors say, give us more and we'll do better. And this is actually quite a counterintuitive because physicians are saying we can do more with less. And so the media has been quite interested in this. And of course, it needs to bring together all the stakeholders, just as you heard before, hospitals, outpatients, um, insurers, to try to change a culture. Um, so it can't be done by any healthcare professional group alone. It needs all the stakeholders to put it into action. So the principles are these, and I'm going to take a few minutes especially to talk about the first one, it being physician-led. Because I think governments and payers all over the world look at these rising costs and say, physicians have not helped us change this. They're skeptical that we as healthcare providers are willing to really take hold of this concern and help make change. But I think that um, payers and governments in particular have limited tools to changing this because when you tell physicians they can't order these tests or we're going to pay less for these kinds of procedures, uh, that's a very uh, blunt instrument Doctors don't like it. It threatens their autonomy. And so I don't think, and I don't think it changes the culture. I think if we're really going to be serious about providing excellent care and making choices about what adds value and what does not add value or even causes harm, it has to be led by providers because we live and breathe in the interaction between the patients and, and in the healthcare system. It's only healthcare providers that could know whether an MRI for low back pain is indicated because there are red flags or there are signs that of neurologic problems or it's not indicated. So it has to be in the clinical context and I think therefore must be led by the profession. And I think that that's a key component of uh, choosing wisely, that it really is a bottom-up grassroots effort as opposed to a top-down um, effort that some might choose to be more efficient, but really, I think, doesn't have a, um, the, F, the uh, opportunity to change the culture. It's patient-focused. It really is about the provider and the patient in the moment making decisions, and I think it must engage patients in um, changing this more is better kind of um, view that we've created. It's evidence-based, which of course, all healthcare professionals believe in, and therefore it has to be based on the best evidence available. It should be multi-professional, and I, in Canada we have not been as successful as the U.S. in engaging nursing, but I think they're critical. Um, pharmacists, for sure, in working on over-treatment uh, with drugs, and there's some very interesting research about, uh, in Canada about uh, how pharmacists can play a key role in reducing inappropriate overuse. And the processes used to create the lists need to be transparent so people know what went into them and realize that they are excellent evidence. So these are some of the principles that I think have crossed a lot of the campaigns and helped them to be successful. So it really is about a culture change. I often say it's not just about what's on the list. It's really getting us to talk about overuse. And I don't know about you, but in my, um, my career in practicing general internal medicine, both in the U.S. and Canada, where I've, I've been through my career, I really have never seen physicians talk about what we should stop doing. I've seen us over the years talk about what we should start doing, but rarely do we talk about what we should stop doing. And trainees certainly don't get, um, uh, they get praised for being thorough and thinking of every disease it might be and ordering tests to rule it out. But I don't think in our culture we've trained trainees to be more thoughtful and parsimonious in their thinking about what they're ordering. So I really think this is both on the, the healthcare professional and the patient side truly a culture change, and that's not easy. It takes time and a lot of effort. 
So the lists in North America, just how many people have seen these lists from other places? So just a few, I mean, I'm gonna just show with you, you know, this is like, um, I'm not expecting you to read it, but this is like family medicine in, in Canada. We um, uh, asked them to come up with five, but actually they came up with 11. Um, and they, you know, all look like this. Don't do imaging for low back pain unless red flags are present. And of course, you're gonna see the similarity because I see this is on the Swiss list too. And there is a lot of uniformity in what's starting to emerge. Here's another one. Big issue in, in Canada, don't do annual screening blood tests unless indicated by the patient's risk profile. Because of course, many patients come into the doctor for their annual exam and expect a large battery of tests to be done every year. And so this is part of the culture. We had a hard time in Canada getting physicians to start the statements with don't. And I wanna take a moment to talk about that because, um, you know, in Canada, we like to be polite and we don't, uh, you know, so we wanted to not, we, people wanted to say avoid and things which are a little softer. But we think if you're really gonna change the culture, you need bold statements. And that don't is a clear indication about what we want people not to do when it's not indicated. It's not that you don't do it when it is indicated, but we, so we've tried to have most of our statements start with the word don't. Um, to be clear that this is really a culture change. Uh, here's an American list of, of obstetrics and gynecology. Similarly, don't select, don't schedule elective non-medically indicated inductions or C-sections before 39 weeks of gestation. So they also tried to encourage the use of the word don't to start all these statements. And in the states now, there are over 70 societies that have created lists in Canada, we have over 45 societies, and we just started actually a year ago. Um, so there are many of them around, and you can draw from them. You don't have to recreate the wheel. In Canada, we looked at the American lists to get ours going, although we felt that many of the things they do in the States were not relevant in Canada, as we have a, a system that is a single payer, and it, it doesn't have as much overuse in some areas. All, many of the campaigns have patient materials like this one in the States. Consumer Report was a very key partner right from the beginning in Choosing Wisely. They've created patient pamphlets, and I, I'm not trying to have you read them, but they all have this kind of flow, imaging tests for low back pain when you need them and when you don't. And they tell patients when they do need them but they explain that you don't get better faster from just having the x-rays. They explain the risks. And I think what's very important to patients is not just direct risk like excess radiation or drug reactions, but they explain false positives. In my experience, patients don't understand false positives. They think there's no harm in having tests. And it's very important to explain that concept, which you brought up also. And then all of these pamphlets include tips to help you get your back pain better. So in that little blue, uh, that box on the side, there's always advice for patients. And we've done extensive testing in North America, both in the US and Canada, on these kinds of brochures. And patients have given us lots of um, indication that they're very helpful. So it's got to have a key public education or patient education component. We have uh, these questions to ask your doctor, do I really need this test or treatment? What are the downsides? Are there simpler or safer options? And what happens if I do nothing? And in part of the Canadian campaign, we have these all over waiting rooms in family doctor's offices. So I think I wanna shift and say, of course, it's not just about um, creating these materials it's, it's, and the lists, it's implementing them that we're, you know, where we really have to take action. And of course, there are simple things that we can do like in educational events like these. There's then quality improvement, uh, like audit and feedback where physicians might get information back about how they're performing. And then there are many uh, things evolving in North America where these uh, choosing wisely recommendations are getting embedded in the electronic medical record. So I want to give you, and much of this isn't published yet,
because it's recent. So I just want to share with you a little bit of some examples of what's starting to emerge. So this is from Cedar sinai which is a, a hospital in um, Los Angeles that treats all the movie stars. It's known to be very expensive, one of the most expensive hospitals in North America. And what they did is they embedded 180 of the Choosing Wisely recommendations in their electronic medical record on physician order entry. So in this case, if you go to order a benzodiazepine in a patient over 65, the American Geriatric Society recommendation pops up that shows you that it can do more harm than good. And of course, you can override it. But what they have found in their research is that in general, um, depending on what they're looking at, they find a decrease in some of it, you know, ranging to 20 and even, I spoke to them recently, 30 percent um, of uh, a decrease in these drug categories when they use these prompts. Now, physicians override them about 50 percent of the time, but um, they are showing a significant impact that's enduring over time because of their electronic order entry system. This is another example that I like a lot from uh, UCSF. The, this is a box that shows at UCSF in San Francisco, their major academic hospital, they realized that blood transfusions were overused, meaning that they were used when a hemoglobin didn't warrant it, it wasn't low enough, or they gave two units of blood when one, one was possible enough. And so, uh, they mapped all the transfusions being done in the hospital. And the bigger the box, a big box means a lot of transfusions are done. So hospital medicine does a lot of transfusions, and below it, malignant hematology does a lot of transfusion. But they also mapped, um, or the, the redder the box, the darker the box, the more the blood is transfused inappropriately. So uh, it's better to have a light box than a dark box. And, it, um, and so these are, they map this by unit. But then they also map them by individual physician. And so what you see is that there might be two doctors who both practice hospital medicine, one who has a very dark box, um, meaning they, oh, they use a lot of transfusions inappropriately, um, over the Choosing Wisely recommendations, and one right next to him who sees the same patients on the same clinical ward transfuses a lot less. And so this kind of mapping is very powerful in changing behavior, because if you're the person with the re bright red box and your next door neighbor has got a light box, you really want to know why. What are they doing differently than me? And you know, this harnesses, I think, in a really good way, the competition among us to be the best we can be. And when we see data, it changes our behavior. So this, they drop the rates of inappropriate transfusions quite a bit. In Canada, we have a campaign all over the country called Why Use Two When One Will Do to try to bring down the transfusions. So, I mean, people talk about all the time, how are we gonna measure the impact of this campaign? And though I only have a, a few minutes, I want to just say that I think it really is a multifactorial kind of approach we need to take. We look, need to look at provider attitudes and awareness because we have lived in the more is better culture. Um, we need to look at patient perceptions. Um, how does the public see this? And of course, we, in the middle, we have to look at provider behaviors um, over time. But I think there is emerging literature, but it's not all there yet. But there is a lot of work on baseline rates of how we do things. And I think across the world, one of the indicators that's having a lot of interest is the use of preoperative EKGs, chest X-rays, et cetera, in low-risk patients. This, for example, is an article in the New England Journal where they looked at um, the baseline rates and the months preoperative before cataract surgery, so very low risk surgery, and they saw that a good number of patients had multiple tests in the, the month before a very low risk surgery. In, in, in Ontario, we've done similar things, and we find 30% of our patients are getting EKGs 
in very low risk outpatient surgeries. And so this is one of the ones that I think is uh, ripe for intervention. So it's clearly now uh, around, becoming quite an international campaign. These are, there, were about, there are about 17 countries ranging from Australia and New Zealand. Brazil was at our most recent meeting, Korea, South Korea and Japan, and then many of the European countries using different names, as you know, but you can see that all of the campaigns are recent. Um, the United States, which is the oldest one, started in 2012. We launched in Canada in 2014. And this is one of the reasons that I think it's going to take us time to get the evidence that we need to answer the question that many people would ask, well, is it making a difference? But the international community has sort of been working together to share best practices, share strategies for implementation. We're looking at developing common metrics across multiple countries, and I'll show you that we're working with the OECD, uh, based in Paris, who is, you know, as creates that report called Health at a Glance, and is now working with us to look at measures of overuse across all the 40 OECD countries. And we, of course, want to share what kinds of policy implications there are. In fact, the, the international group has come up with a top 10 list of the 10 most common items. You again will see these similarities. I noticed in the Swiss list that the imaging for low back pain, antibiotics for viral infections, the use of uh, proton pump inhibitors long term for GI symptoms, and, and these other ones. Um, in Canada, I can tell you that we're very interested in the use of antipsychotics for treatment of dementia uh, and are trying to measure this across the country to see if we can bring down rates. I think we, we have to capture the hearts and minds of physicians um, to get on board. So in Canada, like I said, we have the why use two, well, when will do to try and get rid of urinary catheters. We have a part of the campaign called lose the tube um, to try and get physicians to participate. These are the three things that the OECD is um, uh, measuring, imaging for low back pain, antibiotics for viral infections, and as I mentioned in the Cedar sinai example, the benzodiazepines in patients over 65. So we may be able to have some comparisons between countries to see how we're doing and learn from one another. So I think there are lessons emerging, um, you know, in this international com community. Um, it's really a physician-led campaign. It has to be bottom-up. I don't think a top-down approach will be as effective in changing the culture because it won't capture the hearts and minds of physicians and won't be where we live and breathe. But we have to be serious about it because if we don't take leadership, I think others will. And we really understand the needs of patients, but we have to act on it. I think there has to be a robust patient side of the campaign. It's very hard to change the culture of more is better. I'll show you in my next talk some of the things we're doing in Canada. But I think we really have opportunities to share learning from one another and to look at measurement together. Just one last comment. We really are at the beginning. We have a long way to go, but I think the level of energy and creativity that's in many countries says there's something really right in this message. And so I look forward to working with all of you as we um, make progress together. Thank you. A questo punto, prima di passare la parola alla dottoressa Vernero, eh, vi chiedo se avete dei commenti o delle domande alle due presentazioni che, introduttive che sono state fatte dal dottor Slupe e dalla dottoressa Levinson. Io ne avrei una alla dottoressa Levinson. Uh, what is, in your opinion and in experience, the role of politicians in the Choosing Wisely movement? The role, the role of politicians. It's a very good question. Um, we've worked very closely with our government, 
who have funded us. So we have funding from our government. But what we said to them is, if they were going to fund us, they needed to stay far away from it. Their name is not on any of our materials. If government looked too involved, we felt that it would undermine our efforts because both doctors and patients would think it was a rationing exercise. And um, it's a very difficult message because I know that government needs results quickly. But we were very clear with them that while we needed their money to get the campaign going, we also needed them to trust that we were serious and to let us have a uh, doctor-led initiative. Thank you very much. Dr. Schlup, uh, de part, quel est votre commentaire là-dessus? I, I agree 100%. Uh, this uh, support, this government support is very important, but uh, uh, staying away is also very important not to uh, to disturb this uh, breeding culture which is necessary to develop uh, choosing wisely. Uh, so help us, but uh, from uh, a bit of distance. 